Hello, and welcome to today's webinar presentation from RHEL Midwest, entitled Recruiting and Retaining Teachers in Rural Communities. My name is Tori Zirks. I am the Alliance Lead for the RHEL Midwest Rural Research Alliance and a Senior Technical Assistance Consultant at AIR. And today we have a really great panel um, of presenters that are going to talk to you and share their expert experience and expertise um, around recruitment and retention of quality educators in rural communities. You'll notice on the left hand of your screen, there is a box labeled speaker bios. And if you click on those bios, you'll be able to see additional information about our presenters. And they are also going to spend some time introducing themselves when they are um, but it's their portion of the webinar. But the photos, title, and email addresses of each of the speakers are included in that window. Um, and so you can get a, a, a chance to see what they look like during the presentation. And it hopefully will um, you know, help create a, a smaller sense of community, although I know we have uh, quite a, a number of people on the webinar today. Throughout the webinar, we are trying to make this as interactive as possible. So please ask questions of the experts throughout the, the presentation. There is a Q&A function in the box on the right side of your screen. And during the course of each presentation, um, in the background, we'll be compiling those questions and comments that you submit. And at the end of each present, of all of the presentations, excuse me, um, we will spend some time at the end of the hour to submit those questions to the presenters or pose those questions to the presenters and engage in some conversation. Um, we also encourage you to engage in the chat with your fellow participants throughout the webinar. And you can do that using the group chat box, again, on the right side of your screen. Um, and you can click on the dark blue word bubble icon at the bottom middle of your screen as well. It will look a little bit like a texting symbol or a comment box. Uh, but once you click on that icon, um, the box will pop up and you can submit your questions. So you know, as I mentioned, the Q&A box will allow you to communicate with the presenter on the webinar and ask very targeted questions. The group chat will allow you to communicate with fellow participants on the webinar. And after you type your message or your question into either box, just hit return or enter um, to post your message. So the agenda for today's conversation, um, it, looks, it looks like a lot to get through in an hour, um, but we're going to do it. Um, we're going to provide a little bit of information about RHEL Midwest and, and the event for today. Um, we're going to go through the research base around recruitment and retention of teachers in rural communities, um, talk a little bit about the pros and cons of, of Grow Your Own, um, <clears throat> move into some examples. Um, and so what we're really hoping today is, is really mixing that research with the practical examples of what this actually looks like in the field, and then again, end up with some time for question and answers at the end. The overall goals of the event are as follows. First, um, we hope to increase the knowledge base in rural Midwest states of research being done on teacher recruitment and retention strategies for rural communities. We hope to provide insight into an Illinois application of a Grow Your Own initiative, providing both lessons learned uh, from this strategy, as well as provide an example from Ohio on innovations and hiring criteria and retention strategies. So those three goals, increasing the knowledge base and providing examples and insight from two of the states in the rural Midwest region, are really what the presentations for today have been designed around. And at the end of the webinar, you'll be asked to complete a post-event evaluation survey to let us know how, how well we did. And, and trying to meet those goals uh, for, for the day. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about RHEL Midwest. If you're new uh, and don't really know a lot about us, RHEL Midwest is part of a network of 10 regional educational laboratories that are funded by the U.S. Department of Education's Institute of Education Sciences. Each RHEL serves a designated region of the country and focuses on the national priority of helping states and districts use data and analysis to address important policy and practice issues with the goal of improving student outcomes. We improve student um, academic outcomes by helping states 
school districts and schools systematically use data by conducting and supporting high quality research and evaluation and by promoting evidence-based decision making. The work of the Rural Research Alliance really aims to increase awareness of rural specific issues related to post-secondary access and success in the Midwest and to help improve stakeholder capacity to most effectively target resources for rural populations. And the work of the Rural Research Alliance has really evolved over the last few years um, to include definitely this post-secondary post access and success, but also a real um, examination or of the recruitment, retention of effective teachers, what, um, what that pipeline looks like in rural communities. And so a lot of what um, our Alliance members have been very interested in uh, resulted in today's webinar. So very excited to um, get to the meat of the presentation and introduce our first presenter, who's Dr. Douglas Gagnon. Uh, with the Carsey School of Public Policy at the University of New Hampshire, and he is going to um, talk to us about his research, and um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Doug, uh, but let me know if I need to um, move any of the slides forward. Thanks, Tori. I'll, I'll take care of advancing the slides, uh, and th thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to share with you some work that I uh, conducted along with my colleague, Beth Mattingly, at the Carsey School. Um, and, and basically, we wanted to know what, what states have planned, uh, you know, in terms of the policies that they've laid out uh, to help uh, rural schools get, get more of their share of, of really great teachers and keep those great teachers. Um, so to start things off, we just have a, a poll question um, to get you kind of thinking back to when, um, you know, you were in school. Um, you know, what was your experience with teachers? What adjective of, the, of these four would you say best describes the teachers that you had, um, you know, were they clueless or engaging, or would you say they're unqualified or or knowledgeable? Just to get you be thinking about you know, the, the variability in, in in teachers that might be out there. All right. Take a look at what people are saying. It's like, it's like knowledgeable is up there, uh, and then engaging, and just a few had more of the clueless teachers in their school. Nobody unqualified, so much like um, the HQT requirement where no one's unqualified, so that's funny. Um, so this was just to get you thinking about, you know, what is it like um, to, to, to have a great teacher at school compared to not, not having such a great teacher. Um, and, and basically, you know, one thing we know is that just like any profession, there are great teachers and, and less than great teachers. Uh, and, and something else we know is that uh, the great teachers, are, you know, if you're a poor or minu minority student, you're less likely to have one of those in front of you. Um, and this, is, this really um, spurred the, the, uh, what, what are called teacher equity plans, um, which the call for them were, was made about two years ago. Uh, by Secretary Duncan, requiring each state to take a look at at, at their data and, and and make sure that poor and minority ch children in their state aren't taught by um, either inexperienced, unqualified, or out of field teachers at higher rates uh, than other students in their state. Um, and th there are a few components to these plans. You know, the first thing that that uh, states had to do was analyze their teacher equity gaps. Uh, so basically some proxy for teacher excellence. Is there a gap uh, between, uh, you know, poor and affluent schools? Is there a gap between racially diverse schools versus, uh, you know, uh, racially homogenous schools, for instance? Um, and if, if a state were to identify a gap, uh, they had to propose a strategy to close that gap. And uh, states had to look at these three statutory metrics um, you know, rates of in inexperienced or unqualified or out-of-field teachers. Um, but they could go beyond that, and many states did to look at, uh, say, observational data from teacher evaluation systems or teacher turnover trends, et cetera. Um, and 
although it was required to to look at you know accessing uh, gaps in access uh, along lines of poverty and and racial composition, doing so across uh, urbanicity or rurality, basically across some sort of place metric, uh, wasn't required. Um, but we know that from the research that rural teachers are less likely to um, hold a master's degree or to have attended selective college. Uh, they're more likely to um, be a novice, to be teaching out of field. Um, and and, and more, more than that, uh, we know that if you were to propose a strategy to try to help staffing solutions in a rural school, uh, you know, rural schools have unique context. That by definition, they're more remote. Uh, and, and less, you know, in a less dense area, um, and and they're all more more likely to be small uh, and poor. So, uh, you know, we really wanted to know what is being done out there at states uh, in, in terms of whether or not they looked at uh, their their data around rural teachers and whether or not um, they proposed some staffing solutions. And, and the first step in doing that was going out uh, into the research and seeing what was being done um, by by other states um, prior to to this uh, call for teacher equity plans. Um, and what we did was we kind of organized uh, all these strategies that we found, these rural specific strategies, into uh, four different buckets, grow your own, financial incentives, communities of practice, and capacity building. Um, and so real quick, I'll just run through what I mean by these. We're, we're going to hear from other presenters as they go into the, the nitty gritty and uh, you know, on the ground experiences with some of these. Um, so grow your own programs are really, as the name suggests, trying to develop existing talent pools. And the idea is that if you grow up in a rural area or you have positive experiences, you're more likely to want to stay there. Uh, and, and they can really target anywhere along the continuum from uh, current high school students, uh, you know, introducing education careers to them or working with IEGs to create rural specific programs, say rural student teaching placements, for instance. Uh, you know, are trying to retrain at the professional level, trying to turn, say, service-oriented professionals like ex-military into classroom teachers or or uh, creating pipelines to, to uh, allow paraprofessionals to upskill to be classroom teachers. Um, financial incentives uh, are also something used in rural schools, and, and clearly <clears throat> financial incentives aren't limited to rural schools, but uh, rural teachers make a lot less. Uh, and, and they also uh, move uh, to higher paying schools uh, outside of rural areas more often than the inverse. Uh, so th there's reason to believe that financial incentives that might be particularly um, attractive in rural areas. <clears throat> in reviewing the literature, you see lots of different ways that, that incentives can take place, you know, be it um, signing retention bonuses, uh, trying to create something more in kind like uh, like housing stipends or providing housing stock in areas where it's typically short, uh, or loan forgiveness is another uh, possibility for, for financial incentives. Uh, rural communities of practice are trying to develop in-service teachers and you know better prepare and, and retain teachers that are already in uh, rural settings. Again, you know why the rural context? Because uh, when, when you're dealing with small and isolated communities, it, you, you have different constraints in trying to develop teachers. So, for instance, rural teachers have voiced concerns about not having subject and grade level peers. Um, and, and so rural communities of practice uh, try to kind of bridge this gap through either mentoring and induction programs that are really situated in the community or utilizing distance learning technologies and really just trying to bring rural schools together. <clears throat> and finally, capacity building is kind of this uh, catch-all category for anything that, that didn't uh, neatly fit into those other three. Um, and basically, uh, I'm already running a little low on time here, so I'll kind of try to move things along a little faster. Basically, what we were looking at is how often were these practices uh, being proposed in, in, teacher, uh, in the teacher equity plans of, of the uh, 47 available state plans that, that were out there. Um, and, and, you know, are rural states doing this more often than non-rural states, et cetera? Um, and we find that about 14 of, of the available plans take into account, take, they take a look at their rural data and, and they propose something that is articulated uh, to try to meet the needs of rural schools specifically. Um, 11 states looked at their rural data but didn't actually propose anything that was really tailored to the rural context. Um, there were 10 states that did the opposite. They, they didn't. Uh, 
actually look at their data across reality whatsoever, so they couldn't tell you that rural teachers are less qualified or there's higher turnover in their state and rural schools. Uh, but they still propose real specific policy solutions. Uh, and 12 states really didn't uh, take into account any of those, any of the rural contacts, either in their data uh, or in their strategies. Um, and, and when you see how this is um, spread out across uh, U.S., uh, you know, states that are, that are accounting for that rural context um, can be found just about anywhere. Um, When we looked at the types of strategies being employed by different states uh, across those four categories that I, I quickly outlined, we found that it's pretty evenly um, distributed uh, across them. So one out of five states proposed some sort of grow your own program for, for rural schools in their state. Um, over one in four had some sort of targeted financial incentive for a rural school for teachers in, in high need rural schools. Uh, nearly one in five had some sort of rural community practice to try to retain and develop rural educators, um, and about one in three had some sort of other strategy aimed at building the capacity of, of rural schools. Interestingly, there wasn't really much of a relationship between the rurality of a state and how much they accounted for the rural context uh, in their policy plan. So whether or not they looked at, at, their, at their data in their rural schools had almost nothing to do with whether or not they were a, a highly rural state. That's that um, column on, in, in the middle there, the portion that analyzes rural equity gaps. You see that if you're a highly rural state, you, you have few, fewer of those states actually looked at their data than states of, of moderate uh, rural importance. Uh, and and then if you're a more rural state, you're only slightly more likely to propose something that was really rural specific. So, you know, what can we take from this? Basically, we know that there are definitely steps being taken to try to improve teacher staffing in, in rural communities. There's a recognition that um, there, are, there are challenges to, to uh, attracting and keeping and developing teachers in rural schools. Um, and, and we're really just starting to look at data <clears throat> to help us, um, you know, uh, drive and, and, and make the right uh, staffing policy um, uh, choices. <clears throat> However, you know, there is a lot of, of innovation out there, um, and uh, I think there's a lot to be learned as states are starting to implement uh, some of these, uh, you know, really innovative strategies that, that are aimed at, at helping rural schools. Um, and, you know, hopefully with, with the improvement of data systems, you know, we'll be able to have a better chance uh, to, to measure the effectiveness of the programs and, and see whether it moves the needle or not on, on improving, you know, the, the, the level of, of uh, you know, teacher effectiveness or teacher qualities in rural schools as compared to other schools. So hopefully that gives you a, a brief overview of, of what's going on uh, on the policy side of things. Uh, we'll have a quick question and answer at the end, uh, and, and feel free to email me directly if, if you didn't have time to, to ask your question. So I'll, I'll pass it off to John. Hello. Uh, my segment here is on uh, the kind of based on some research that I did on rural schools in Illinois. And we're going to start off with a poll question. Can you recall any homegrown teachers at your school, primary, middle, or high school? And we'll give you a second there to respond. Let's check those responses. Looks like uh, majority here had at least one homegrown teacher, uh, but that was kind of followed by not having any idea where their teachers were from. Um, and chances are, if you grew up in a rural school, that they were not necessarily from the community that you uh, that you uh, went to school at, according to the research that I did. I asked three primary questions here. Um, what I want to know the re what factors brought teachers into to work into small schools, what what kept them there, and what the teachers themselves thought, what strategies they thought would help to increase teacher recruitment and retention. And I surveyed teachers in the 24 smallest public school districts in Illinois. We have 24 districts that are actually under 100 students. And those are the districts I focused on because research shows that the smallest districts have the most trouble with teacher recruitment and retention and typically have between 25 to 50% teacher 
turnover. I uh, had uh, 210 teachers were asked to participate, and I had about 54 percent, 113 of them respond. And I actually was replicating a study that Marcia Davis did in Montana, um, and, and she looked at teacher recruitment and retention in Montana in 2002 and used the research of Colin Boylan, um, who developed the theory of teacher recruitment and retention, which focused on what he called four spheres of influence, classroom, whole school, community, and family personal uh, spheres. So the factors were all related to those. Um, as far as the recruitment factors that uh, were most influential to teachers accepting rural assignments, uh, number one was best or only job offer, uh, enjoying the rural lifestyle, family and or home close by, and small class size. Uh, the two of the most influential recruitment factors identified in this study were also among the top four factors in the Davis study, enjoying the rural lifestyle and family or home close by. The least influential to teacher recruitment uh, were uh, school recruitment program, access to recreational activities, opportunity to practice multi-age teaching, and materials and resources available. And all of these were also the least, re least influential recruitment factors in the Davis study. The sphere of influence that was most influential to teacher recruitment uh, was family personal, and this also replicated the findings of the Davis study. Uh, and basically, to summarize, I found that teachers are most apt to accept rural assignments if they're at the beginning of their career, and it's because they're, it's their best or only job offer, and because rural lifestyle appeals to them or they have family nearby. For retention factors, um, I found that teachers, number one thing that kept them in their schools was relationships with their students, followed by safe environment, small class size, and support from the administrator. And the sphere of influence that was most influential to them for re teacher retention was community and within classroom factors. And this also mirrored the, the Davis findings. Um, the least influential retention factors were professional development opportunities, spouse partner employment um, were uh, the least influential, and these were also mirrored in the Davis study. For um, what strategies teachers themselves perceived as being most important for teacher recruitment and retention, uh, providing competitive insurance packages, salaries competitive with other states, more flexibility with scheduling, including flexible personal days, and then a state-funded uh, bonus, basically, for teachers working in small rural public schools. The least influential factors that teachers themselves rated uh, as seeing the least influential for teacher recruitment and retention was help with finding housing, um, grow your own initiatives, uh, stipends for teachers to earn national board certification, and student teacher placement. And this too mirrored the Davis study in finding uh, that these were also ranked as being least effective in that study too. So the spheres that were most influential to teacher recruitment were family personal and whole school. So basically, uh, I also looked at uh, whether or not teachers were actually satisfied and happy working in the rural schools, and I found that that they answered this question at, at uh, the same levels as the national average, 67%, and slightly less than the Davis study. And these teachers would said that they would choose teaching as a career all over again. So this seemed to indicate that the teachers in the small school districts of Illinois are happy with their profession and that the high teacher uh, uh, turnover in these districts is not a result of displeasure with the profession. I also looked at some research regarding Grow Your Own initiatives in my study, and I looked at the Heisman study of 2008, which concentrated on rural schools in Florida. And he found and, and actually concluded that it would be advisable to limit the number of homegrown teachers in a rural district because transplanted teachers, it was perceived that they had more power um, 
transplanted teachers perceived that the power was placed with homegrown teachers regardless of their educational experience, educational level, or quality of work, and their social affiliations with administrators, teachers, leaders, or community leaders. So there seemed to be some resentment, he found, of the homegrown teachers. But then, obviously, there's other research as well. And the Williams study of 2010 kind of found the opposite. Um, they, they really suggested that teacher recruitment and retention problems could be improved by homegrown teachers. And, you know, we know that North Carolina, Georgia, and Virginia have all had homegrown programs in place for several decades and have worked with local universities to provide fast-track certification for non-certified employees. And Virginia has even had districts that have given an opportunity to earn college credit to students while they're still in high school um, for hard-to-teach areas. But basically, like any study, I had some recommendations at the end and uh, go over those now. For teacher recommendations, I found that the rural schools had very little diversity, and it's not really surprising, but I had like 100% Caucasian teachers that responded to my study. And uh, there was also not very much gender diversity. It was overwhelmingly female. Um, so I think gender diversity is something that administrators could at least look to, to, to try to achieve. Rural educational leaders also need to look for teachers who have a rural background since they're most likely to stay in the rural district. And I suggest that they have some interview questions asking teachers where they, they grew up because my research seemed to show that it was more important that a teacher grew up in a rural setting than it was that they grew up in that actual rural school district because the majority, it was something like 70%, lived outside of the districts where they teach. Uh, the importance of homegrown teachers and housing programs for rural schools might, off, might also be overstated by the rural research. And some considerations for educational leaders. Um, the big finding in my study was that what attracts teachers to teach in a rural school is not necessarily what keeps them there. That they accept rural assignments primarily for that family personal sphere and for the whole school uh, sphere, but they stay in that rural assignment because they fall in love with their community and because they fall in love with their classroom. Um, also that Teachers indicated that marketing in their rural districts was either non-existent or not very helpful. And one of the things I found was that half of these rural districts that I uh, surveyed did not even have their own websites, uh, which is actually a state requirement in Illinois, but it's not necessarily in enforced. And uh, that could even be a starting point because we know that a lot of young people today are going to look first on the Internet, and if they can't even find a website for the district, that might kind of turn them off. And then exit interviews, I think, would be a very good idea for rural administrators to do, and they might actually want to have a third party do conduct them um, so that teachers can answer and, and not feel any possible reprisals, but to find out why teachers are actually leaving, what their reasons are, uh, since we know that they're actually satisfied with the profession. And then I think the findings are very important for communities because if it's the community that the teachers fall in love with, then they, and we know that the majority of them don't live in that community, we need to make them feel included. And, and rural community leaders need to make sure that teachers are invited to the different functions going on in the community and that when they are, they're seen as people first and teachers second and, and are made to feel welcome. Um, so that, that's basically followed by my... Um, uh, references. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Aaron Joyce, who is the director of the Ohio Appalachian Collaborative. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you very much, John. Um, my name is Aaron Joyce, and uh, thank you for having uh, me on the webinar today. I am a director in the Learning and Leading Portfolio at Battelle for Kids, and I've had the privilege of working with the Ohio Appalachian Collaborative um, for the last five years. Um, I'm also a RHEL Midwest Rural Research Alliance member, so I really appreciate the opportunity um, to talk to you today and also to hear the great research that's going on that's really helping inform the work of the Alliance. Um, today I'm going to talk about the Ohio Appalachian Collaborative and some of the work that the Collaborative has done in the area of teacher recruitment and retention and actually a lot of the um, strategies and 
findings that the previous two speakers raised uh, are, have been addressed through um, the OAC. So first I want to give you a little bit of background information about the Ohio Appalachian Collaborative and a little bit about Ohio uh, as a rural state. So Ohio has the fourth largest rural school enrollment in the United States. So despite having major urban centers like Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati, uh, we're, we actually have a very large rural population. Uh, also, 32 of Ohio's 88 counties are federally designated as Appalachian. And Ohio's Appalachian region um, tend to struggle economically, and they also have a very low adult educational attainment rates. Only about 12% of adults in Appalachian, Ohio, have a, um, have a degree. So to ad address this issue, Battelle for Kids, the organization for whom I work, and a group of school districts in Ohio's Appalachian counties formed the Ohio Appalachian Collaborative in 2010. And these groups came together in 2010 around a theory of action that we called the Rural Education Transformation Approach. And there are sort of six key components, and I'll be talking about two of those components today, but the, the fundamental theory of action is if you address um, teacher quality, the quality of the leaders in schools, if you engage the community, if you really redesign learning opportunities to increase the rigor and relevance and for kids, uh, if you use data to inform your practice, so keep track of what you're doing and make changes and adjustments because of that, and if you recognize and reward excellence within schools, um, the theory is that you know, if you address these areas, then students from across Appalachian, Ohio, and the districts who are participating, the goal would be for them to graduate from high school with higher aspirations and be better prepared for success in whatever happens after high school, college, career, and their future life. So as I mentioned, today I'm specifically going to talk about um, kind of two key areas in this, this wheel, uh, enhancing teacher quality and recognizing ex excellence. Uh, one little note about the Ohio Appalachian Collaborative, because it comes up a lot, and particularly in rural, rural school districts, is well, how do you pay for all these innovations? What are you doing in terms of um, addressing, you know, how are you able to address all of this, knowing, as um, we've heard, that rural school districts tend to be um, poorly resourced. And that was actually kind of one of the reasons why the OAC came together. Um, the collaborative was founded without a specific funding source, but the districts saw that by working together, they would be better able to leverage funding sources that came out because a lot of state and federal grants and philanthropic grants tended to go to bigger urban districts with greater capacity. And a little district that maybe had 2,000 kids just didn't have the capacity, didn't have grant writers, didn't have the staff to support that. So by coming together, um, over the last five years, the, the uh, Ohio Appalachian Collaborative has been able to leverage federal funding like Race to the Top and the Ohio Teacher, in, or the Teacher Incentive Fund, as well as state um, initiatives like Ohio has what's called the Straight A Fund, which is a set of innovation grants, and then also receiving funding from different philanthropic organizations. So as Doug shared in the beginning, um, and I thought that was a really helpful um, framework in terms of the, the, four, the four main areas, um, I'm going to talk about three. We've already heard um, some in-depth uh, application of the Grow Your Own. Um, I'm going to talk about communities of practice, capacity building, and financial, financial incentives, because these are actually three strategies that um, we've implemented over the last five years in the Appalachian Collaborative, and I'll talk a little bit about how each one of these have played out in the 27 districts that um, comprise the Collaborative. So the first piece um, to talk about is the communities of practice. And I will say the communities of practice has really been the centerpiece of the collaborative efforts around um, increasing teacher quality. Um, and sort of the idea there is, is deal, working with the talent we have. How do you take the talent you have in a rural district and how do you grow and develop that talent? And so the communities of practice are, are a key component. Um, if you look at sort of our main elements here, uh, we have an online professional learning community that connects all 27 um, school districts within our collaborative. And on that online community, um, teachers can take courses. And the courses are, can you either be taken for graduate credit, which helps teachers address their ongoing um, credentialing and licensure requirements, 
or you can go and take the course for a badge and sort of build that sort of online reputation um, through badging. Um, there are also discussion forums which um, address the issue that was raised in, in Doug's um, presentation about a lot of our, our teachers are sort of singletons. You know, you're, you're the only foreign language teacher in your school. You're the only physics teacher in your high school, the only science teacher at the middle school. Um, through the online community, teachers are able to build, um, you know, custom groups, discussion forums, share resources, bounce ideas off of one another, and sort of build those professional connections across districts that they aren't able to address in their own districts. Um, as, as I mentioned, a lot of those are content and um, grade specific groups. So we might have, we have some groups that are specifically focused on um, STEM. We have some that are specifically focused on foreign language. And those have been getting a lot of traction in terms of how teachers are able to uh, work with one another. Um, in terms of the how you get this done, uh, we had some key roles because again, bringing together 27 districts who aren't all necessarily next door to each other, we had some key players. And so each of the districts within the Ohio Appalachian Collaborative uh, has a role called a professional development coordinator. And that person is supposed to, their job is to sort of be the lead cheerleader and facilitator for the online communities of practice. So they build and develop what we found, building, developing communities of practices and PLCs within schools, but then how do you make that transition to an online space? So the, the professional development coordinator gets uh, a fair amount of training to help facilitate um, kind of the movement from face-to-face -face engagement to online engagement. Uh, we've also done a lot of work with each district's technology coordinators, um, making sure, again, that we there's that the platform works, that teachers have access, and that the technology is there for the teachers to be able to, to work together. And then um, here at Battelle for Kids, um, sort of the role that we play is we provide both some content expertise in terms of helping with um, putting together the courses, facilitating dialogues, um, providing some professional learning opportunities, and then also um, we provide some expertise and coordination on the technology side in terms of, again, how do you sort of, what are effective practices around online professional learning? How can we uh, help facilitate teachers in that engagement? So that's the um, communities of practice side. I realize I'm running short on time as well. So um, additionally, um, uh, the other construct of capacity building. Um, as I mentioned, Ohio has a straight A fund, which is uh, the state's Innovate, it's a competitive grant process for innovation in the state. Um, so the rural districts in the Ohio Appalachian Collaborative are building, are really focusing on dual enrollment as a strategy to help boost the college going rate and uh, to help kids earn credentials um, as they exit high school, um, which is really important for the success of the region. So in terms of capacity building, um, the one-time investment through the straight A fund was able to support credentialing of teachers to be able to provide those dual enrollment um, courses in their high school. So they, a lot of teachers needed some additional um, education to get the master's degree to, be, to become um, an adjunct. Um, now that was a one-time investment. The sustainability aspect of that, which focuses again on, on the capacity building construct, looks at each of these districts is taking a look at their hiring practices. So as teachers are coming in, they've looked at hiring around, you know, what are their, are they prioritizing teachers who have that dual enrollment credential already or who, or who are close, who were able to help them sustain their, their dual enrollment opportunities. Um, they're also leveraging teacher leadership opportunities. So identifying those teachers who have the additional credential and what are some ways that, that they can really leverage those teachers. We're also using our distance learning technology to help share and spread the effectiveness of those teachers. So again, uh, if District A has a teacher who can, can teach um, college level chemistry, we're using distance, distance technology so that kids in Districts B and C can have access to that teacher and access to that course content. Uh, additionally, teachers are looking at, or districts are looking at incentives or stipends to really help retain those teachers because they've gone the extra mile, they've gotten the additional education, additional credential, what are some ways um, that districts can, can fund those to keep those teachers and make sure that they're able to um, sustain that capacity. And um, the last piece I wanted to mention as well on the idea of 
financial incentives. Um, so 17 of the current OIC members also have participated in Ohio's Teacher Incentive Fund project for the last five years. Um, of that, uh, the Teacher Incentive Fund, financial incentives are a component. And so there's a strategic compensation award program for teachers who participate in this um, around improving student achievement, recognizing student growth, um, building school capacity, and fostering leadership. So the districts have developed, um, each district has developed their own award models um, and looking at those key elements. But I will say that the financial incentives are very closely tied with the capacity building and the communities of practice because truthfully within the Teacher Incentive Fund, the biggest push has been around um, developing those teachers through professional development and providing a lot of opportunities for them to grow within the profession um, over the course of the five years. So that's an, just another piece where the financial incentives are there, but the financial incentives don't stand alone. They stand in concert with a lot of professional support and development for the districts. So I run through this um, rather quickly because I know we're short on time and it's a five-year project with lots of pieces and parts. I've included um, links to um, both of our, the Ohio Appalachian Collaborative site has a website, as does the Teacher Incentive Fund. And you can, of course, contact me um, if you have additional questions uh, after the slides. Um, so now I would like to pass the presentation over to um, my colleague, Ciara, and she will be talking about her experience as a homegrown teacher. Thanks, Erin. Um, this is Sierra. I am a fifth grade and middle school art teacher at Sherland School, and I am currently a second year teacher. So I get to kind of tell you guys more like story time about my personal experiences of being a homegrown teacher. Um, I just recently graduated from Illinois State University in 2015, um, and what was really special about that is that I did my student teaching through the PDS program, the Professional Development School. And I was able to work in a rather large district in multiple placements. And I think with having that experience, it really made me appreciate my homegrown setting, my rural school. So I'm going to start us off with a poll question right now. And that is, would you want to teach in a K-12 school that you graduated from? So I want to know, no way, why not, you know, I would love to or not sure. So I'll give you a few seconds for that. Okay, I want to see these results. Ooh, I would love to actually take that. So that's nice to know that um, you guys are kind of all agree with me that you would love to go back. Um, and then a few of you are like, why not? You know, sure, it sounds good. Um, it is strange at times. I can't agree with that. Um, and a few of you are saying no way, which, again, I think it kind of depends on what your experience was in that school. Um, so I'm going to kind of start off with my own kind of homegrown experience. Um, I do think that your experience at the school definitely makes it meaningful, and that depends, kind of, you know, helps you figure out whether or not you do want to go back. Um, something that's really special for me is my, my, the school I went to and the school I teach at is a K through eight school. I spent a lot of time there and I, you know, got to experience and meet many teachers and those were the teachers who inspired me to become a teacher. So, um, it's almost a privilege, you know, that I'm working alongside those teachers who made me want to become the teacher that I am. Um, and then also with being a first-year teacher, my mentor was actually the teacher who inspired me to become a teacher. So it was, it was just extra special to know that these people that I always looked up to as a kid are now my colleagues and my friends and people that I, you know, can spend even more time with. Um, another little thing which just, you know, I, the building, just the being in the building feels so special to me. Um, I'm actually, my classroom was my old, my mentor's classroom and was the classroom that like, I was like, I'm going to be a teacher. So when I go to school every single day and opening up the doors into my classroom, I just, it's, it brings back all those memories of like, as a child of how special it was. Um, and then, again, as you're kind of probably getting from this, is it just feels like a privilege. I, I feel like I'm going to be giving something to my students that I got personally. And like, I think they'll 
value this school, value this education, value these teachers because I can demonstrate for, that for them and help them understand how important this is to me. And I think that's very reflective in my teaching. Um, so some things that I kind of figured out that like why a lot of people should stick around with their school that they went to. Um, the first one is, as a new graduate, I could still live at home and save money. Um, a lot of people are coming out of college nowadays with so much debt and loans, and um, it was actually very nice that my parents allowed me to stay at home, and I could save a lot, and, you know, I still had to pay my rent and pay for my bills, but I didn't have to worry as much, and I could, you know, ha having someone there to help me out was very nice, and I could save that money and um, pay off bills, and it was very, very helpful as a first-year teacher. Um, another thing is I'm I'm still involved in my community. I'm very emotionally connected to my community um, and the whole entire area. I am able to coach at the high school, and I'm able to still work at the job I was with when I was younger and be in summer camps and uh, be a counselor, and it's very special to me to be able to still stay involved in the community. And then also with my students, I can kind of get them involved in their community as well just because I know it so well. Um, traditions and history. Uh, my school, again, is very small, and it's been around for a long time. So I kind of understand, you know, the little traditions and history and the little things that make my school my school. And I, there's sometimes, like, I know things that other people wouldn't know because I've been there for a while. So that's really special for my kids. Um, and then as a former student, I, like I, I have that emotional connection that no other teacher really understands. I mean, they may feel strongly about our school, but I, I love the school, and I really connect to it, and I want to make sure that, you know, everyone sees how special this place is, not only to me, but to the, my students as well. And then um, lastly, developing stronger student relationships. I definitely think because my school is so small that I am able to connect with my students on a much deeper level. I've taught in classrooms where I had 30 plus students, and then I have one, well now I'm at my rural school where I had 12 this last year. I felt like I could really understand my kids' needs, what they, I knew their families, I knew their interests. I could really differentiate my instruction and make sure that they were engaged and liking what we were doing just because I knew them so personally. Um, with being a homegrown teacher, there's definitely some pros and cons to the whole entire thing. Um, and sometimes the pros are cons and the cons are pros. It kind of goes back and forth. Um, one of the big pros for me is knowledge of the building. A lot of times as a new teacher, you're going into these schools and they're huge and you're trying to just figure out where the copy machine is. And the nice thing about teaching in the school that I went to is I knew where all the classrooms were. I knew my way around. I knew who to go to and where to figure things out. And it was very nice. Um, and then also, going to work feels special. You know, like I, it's nice that it's only five minutes down the road instead of my 20-minute commute that I had when I was student teaching. I get to drive by everything and, you know, take in those memories from when I was on the bus. And it's, it feels very special. Um, another pro is familiar faces. Um, the secretary was there when I was there. The fourth grade teacher was my fourth grade teacher. The kindergarten teacher was the second grade teacher. Um, the social studies teacher I had my eighth grade year is still there. So it's very nice that you can kind of, um, you know those familiar faces. You know who to talk to. Some of the, my students were actually, um, I was a student with their siblings. So it's just very nice that you know them so personally and you, you're not uncomfortable, which again, that familiar face could be a con as you can kind of see on the other side. You know, lucky for me, I didn't have very many negative relationships. So I wasn't able to, I didn't really have anything to worry about that. But I'm sure if you worked in a school where maybe you didn't have um, as positive relationships or anything, maybe those familiar faces could cause some drama. I never really had to experience that, but it could be a con. Um, 
another pro kind of from before is you can really relate to your students' experiences. You can kind of say, hey, when I was here, we did it this way, or when I was here, we did this and it was awful, or hey, we did this and it was great. And it kind of lets them know that you understand and appreciate what they're doing. Um, and then one of the big pros, uh, I always like to say that I'm in it for the outcome, I'm not in it for the income. With being in a rural school, yes, my pay may not be as much as it would be in a larger district, but it does, I feel like I'm, it's more of a meaningful impact that I'm making for my kids, just for those few kids. Um, few cons, again, like with the familiar faces, a lot of times I feel like I'm comparing old to new. I'm always comparing what my experience is like with what their experiences are like, and sometimes it's, they're different. Um, sometimes they're better. Sometimes they may be worse, but I do kind of compare. And then also, um, sometimes you want to, you crave something new. I feel like as a teacher, you're always trying to, you know, find professional learning communities and trying to try new things. And sometimes it gives you the opportunity to try new things, but sometimes you're also wanting to try something even different that maybe this rural school can't give you. So, um, but overall, my experiences have been wonderful. I love teaching where I'm at. I have no reason to leave anytime soon. Um, and it's just been truly like a, a privilege to be there. So I am going to hand it off to Tori, and we're going to go on to our Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sierra. Um, and I am also an Illinois State grad, so I when you were talking, I was, I was pretty excited. Um, go Redbirds. Um, go Birds. So, uh, <laughs> so as you can tell, we gave uh, Sierra, Aaron, uh, John, and Doug a really difficult task, which was share all of uh, the depth and breadth of the knowledge that they have in 10 minutes or less in an hour web webinar. And so I want to thank them for um, – taking the challenge and providing a really great um, framework for today's conversation. And we really wanted to start with, okay, looking across the country, what did Doug find in his study about the different strategies states are implementing? And then dig a little bit more into those strategies where we could see what does that look like for a grow your own, for communities of practice, for financial incentive, for capacity building in different contexts. And then end up with really that practitioner perspective of what does this really look like and, and feel like in the classroom and in the community. And so it was very, very hard. Thank you guys all for doing that. Um, we're going to spend like the next 10 minutes answering some questions that have come in the chat. Um, and want to let you know to continue to put the questions in the chat box. What we can do is if there are um, a lot of questions that come in, we can try to um, you know, answer some of those after today by email. Um, so even if I, we don't get to your question in the Q&A, continue to submit the questions and we'll, and we'll try to get you that information. One of the questions um, that emerged, and this will be for, um, for, for anybody on the panel, um, is that has anyone heard of any teacher residency programs in any of the states that you work with that result in a teacher receiving a master's degree in rural education? This is uh, Doug Gagnon again. <clears throat> um, there are, I have heard of, of a couple of uh, residency type programs. Um, the uh, U.S. Department of Ed funds um, teacher residency grants uh, from time to time, and sometimes they have a rural component to them, and, and they currently have uh, RFP out for that right now, and I know there is a uh, Cal State University at Bakersfield um, won a grant for this, uh, in which they paired with three different rural districts in the in the Central California Valley, um, and that was a you know there's another question I saw about um, whether or not there's a cohort component to some of these uh, rural uh, teacher development type programs, and so this would be an example of both. Um, I mean, I don't know, if the, I don't think the master's degree is specifically, you know, in rural education, but I, I assume that there's a, there's a kind of a component to their uh, curriculum development that is trying to help teachers uh, think about what's unique about teaching in rural schools. So, um, yeah, you, I, I uh, recommend that the, the person that asked the question to, to check out that residency program at, at TSU Bakersfield. A 
there's one program, this is, this is Tori, um, I, I don't believe it's a master's degree, but in Iowa, um, the Iowa Teacher Quality Partnership Grant was focused specifically on teacher uh, residency programs in rural communities where they were trying to increase placement. Um, I don't believe it was had the master's degree component, but that might be another um, teacher residency program you, you could potentially take a look at. Um, the next question, and this probably won't be a surprise to anyone since ESSA is at the top of everybody's um, kind of list of, of what's going to happen and, and what are the regulations going to mean. Um, so we had a question about, um, and again, this will be open for anyone, about what impact, if any, do you see ESSA having on teacher recruitment and retention in rural areas? And in particular, do you see any opportunities within ESSA um, again, knowing that the regulations are still being developed by the department, um, but do you, what opportunities do you see to enhance recruitment and retention of um, effective teachers in rural areas? I'd like to jump in with that one, uh, this is John Alfords, but I think uh, as an administrator that that's going to be a really good thing because some rural high schools have been hard pressed to offer all of the courses that they'd like to because of the highly qualified uh, qualifications for teachers and have had to sometimes resort to distance learning as a result. And I think that will relieve some of that pressure. And also with the loosening of Title I requirements and enabling uh, rural schools to use Title I funds in different ways, I think that's going to relieve some of the stresses in the rural school budgets too. So I see those as both positive developments. Anyone else want to want to weigh in? Okay. Um, another question, and again, it's to everybody. Um, so we we talked a lot about these different strategies and what they might look like. Um, what do we know about the effectiveness of each of those strategies, or are these initiatives that are being implemented either too new? Um, to really see what the effect it might be, and if so, you know, what recommendations or what ideas do you guys have around uh, measuring the effectiveness of those strategies? Hi, this is Erin. I, I can jump in on, on that one. Um, so both with the Ohio Appalachian Collaborative, we've been working on, on this work for a fair amount of time, um, but I also say that, you know, we're sort of at different phases of, of, diff of implementing different strategies. Um, so. With a lot of our funding streams, we also have an evaluation component. So there's an evaluation study that is coming out of, of TIFF. Um, we also have some evaluation work with the Ohio Appalachian Collaborative with the Straight A grant. Um, in terms of sort of the early effectiveness and what are some things we're looking at uh, on the TIFF side, those, those, the TIFF districts have seen an increase um, if using some of the different types of, of measures um, that are available to teachers around measuring student growth. So we did see an increase um, in the of teachers who had at least a year's worth of growth or more than a year's worth of growth um, on value added. Um, we've also done a lot of, of sort of perception surveys amongst teachers around how much they value um, sort of the types of professional development and supports they're getting, and those have been very favorable. Um, but I would say keep your eyes peeled for some of the studies that will be coming out as we're sort of wrapping up um, these initiatives. That's always a challenge, you know, to try to figure out um, sort of the impact while you're while you're doing things. On the um, on the other one of the other initiatives, as I mentioned, the dual enrollment component, um, an immediate outcome of the investment in credentialing teachers is that we've had um, more than doubling of the opportunity, the courses that are able to be offered and students are able to access dual enrollment within participating districts. So um, what we're hopeful is, is that the, that's going to translate into students, you know, actually getting all the way to um, a degree, earning more um, credentials and an increase in college going and retention. But at least um, kind of based on the initial investment, we've definitely seen a change in terms of what's being offered to kids in terms of opportunity. And Erin, there's one uh, follow-up question to what you were talking about in terms of the coordinator position for the mm -hmm. uh, collaborative, uh, the, the PD coordinator. Um, there's a question on whether or not that is a paid position or is that a, a committee appointment? 
So at this point, um, within the grant, there the it was the the position each district um, with the straight A funds each district received an allocation. Um, professional development coordinators did receive a stipend. Uh, initially, although that would, once the grant funds are through, the districts would have to sort of sustain um, that position and determine uh, how they might want to incentivize that. Um, but at least the initial training and the initial role was, um, there was a stipend available through the grant. The selection was made um, by each district. And Sierra, for you, there's a question about uh, just how would you suggest helping homegrown teachers like yourself expand the experiences that they have beyond their hometown to help better prepare students for their post-secondary pathway, whatever that might be, whether they go to college or um, move into careers? Um, you know what, with being a homegrown teacher, what I think has been most helpful is your relationships and your friendships with other people. Um, for me, luckily, because I just graduated two years ago, I still keep in contact with a lot of my peers I went to college with. Um, and I think they've been really helpful for me with being a homegrown teacher to kind of expand my horizons. Um, I have many friends who are fifth grade teachers like myself, and I have many friends who are also art teachers. So a lot of times that we can kind of talk to each other about curriculum and figure things out and um, share different resources we've found. Um, so that, I think, has been probably the most helpful thing for me was kind of expanding my horizons being a homegrown teacher. Great. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. 10 minutes flies by. And again, there's always this tension between trying to get as much in and having time for questions. So please continue to put questions in the chat. We'll try to get information um, back to you after after the event. but. Um, I'd like to thank all of our presenters again today. Uh, they did a great job. Um, and I think, you know, as I've been listening, uh, I have so many more questions that the, the Rural Research Alliance at Rural Midwest and our colleagues across the Rural program will be digging into over the course of this year. Um, and so look for information about the Alliance, about resources and publications, um, about upcoming events. Um, for example, in October, we have the uh, the National Rural Education Association Conference um, and the National Rural Education Forum, um, where there will be countless presenters and, and content experts that are going to be talking um, about all different aspects uh, around rural education, but a lot around um, teacher recruitment and retention. Um, and including across RELs, uh, seven different regional education laboratories are going to be working together um, on, a, on a session there. But we have a lot of information on our website, so please check it out. Um, in addition, uh, you can call or email myself, and I can help um, direct you uh, to the right person that you want to talk to from the presentation today. The slide deck and the materials from today will be posted on our website, and so you'll have uh, the opportunity to uh, have their you know, contact information, and I think you notice on some of the slides there's information about their other resources and reports and links, the work that they're doing. So we, that will be um, available online, but please don't hesitate to email or call if you have specific questions. Um, and then finally, again, uh, please take a few minutes uh, to complete our feedback survey. Let us know um, what worked, what didn't. Um, you know, what, whether or not we met our goals, and we will be having additional um, events. So check out the Rel Midwest website to, uh, for upcoming bridge events and webinars and in-person events, and we use all of that information to help improve um, events like this. Um, so again, I want to thank everyone for your time, um, especially our presenters, uh, and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. <laughs>